Well, welcome here to Air Crash Investigator. I know it's been a while. We've been working on some other accident investigations and some other articles. But here, just to carry on with the series, today we're going to have a look at the cozy fish eagle. And um, that was quite a tragic crash. So we will have a look at that. Uh, but first, just uh, to remind you that I'm working in close cooperation here with Seams Aircraft Auditing. And um, yes, uh, there's also Seams Training, online training, as you can see here. And I just wanted to highlight this accident investigation for those of you interested, CRM, everything else. But then today we are looking at the Cozy Fish Eagle Mark IV. Now, right from the beginning, we have to agree that this is a very, let's call it, relatively strange looking and designed aircraft and let's see uh, what happened in this very tragic accident. Well the accident history, the aircraft took off from uh, PE, Port Elizabeth, uh, it flew north, the aircraft obtained 1700 feet, the pilot broadcast at the Mayday, we lost 300 feet in the turn to the aircraft, 1400 feet left for the glide to PE and the last, uh, uh, the, well, the last flight attitude was a steep right-hand bank and a high-speed impact. The pilot was the only occupant, and sorry to say, but it was fatal. Now, let's just have a look at what I'm uh, talking about here. The aircraft got off here. It was uh, running north. I'm just going to give this a little bit of a different color. It was running north and then up there. They got the engine cut, turned around, came back, and at number 99, flew like that. All right, that's not 100 exactly percent, uh, you know, the perfect flight. But let's just, let's just look the, what the pilot was faced with. First of all, I'm uh, just going to say that if you take the whole area where he was, it was built up. So all of this was actually only acceptable if it was there or if it was, well, on the, the, the water itself at sea or maybe next to the, uh, on one of the beaches that he could, could land. But the pilot thought that he would make it back. Now, just a, a little bit on that. Remember that when you turn around to come back, uh, depending on the rate of turn and depending on the speed that you went in, but let's say he had quite a bit of extra speed, he would then uh, not have lost 600 foot per minute as the aircraft would have done normally, but he would have lost some of the, the speed and in trade of also then obviously to maintain some of the height. So it is said that he only lost 300 feet and now we are sitting with uh, 1,400 feet and that at the rate of descent of 600 feet was just not going to make it. The pilot now committed, fully believing that he could make it, he's now flying there. All right, so a little bit about the aircraft information and you know this is, <laughs> this is quite, a, quite a different type. I just want to say here we look at uh, in, let's just look at this part here. Now you see this wouldn't want to work because the color is not right, but there the color is better. And we say that it's got a canard in the front. That is it. And um, yeah, the Wright brothers in the beginning, they actually flew with a canard in the front and they had the elevator in fact on the front of the aircraft. And this is exactly what is, has been done here. Then after that, you can see beautiful uh, design of the aircraft. Now let's go for, okay, so we know the canard is there. And right uh, on the canard, there's the elevator control, the pitch control. In other words, that's now in front of the aircraft center of gravity, not at the rear. And here I say that the canard is attached to the longitudinal axis with a positive angle of two degrees. All right. Hmm. So th that means that the main plane is, uh, well, attached to the body 
at zero degrees. Okay, maybe you've built it slightly different. You put one degree in here, but there will normally always be a two de degree difference between, uh, let's call it, uh, the angle of the elevator section to the angle of the wing section as it is then uh, related to the longitudinal axis of the aircraft. Okay, so in this case it was like that. And now you must just remember that uh, a wing surface will stall when it gets to around about 16 degrees. So in this case, the nose part will stall before the main wing part. So technically speaking, under normal circumstances, you won't be able to stall the main wings. You're going to stall the front and the nose is going to dip down and then it's going to pick up and the nose is going to dip down. So if it stalls at 60 knots, it will pitch down and you'll probably maintain a minimum speed uh, of that stalling speed. And we'll get a little bit later into that. So um, just a reminder that the canine does, uh, you know, contribute to the total lift. The main wings are at zero attached to the reference to the longitudinal accident axis and the cannot stalls before the gliding speed is between 85 and 95 pitch control down to about 60 knots so it looks like and yeah give or take a little bit because remember it's also a hold build but if everything goes well you should get down to 60 knots you should get control after that then obviously the attitude is going to be too high and you're going to lose uh, the cannot which will stall so here we're not necessarily talking about wingtip stalling and so on. Although, remember, you can get that if you force it and you use momentum to go past those degrees. That's, that's a different story. The aircraft must be hard handled to get into a full stall. And due to being a whole build, speeds may vary not uh, just due to the weight, but other changes due to the standard of the finish. Now, I've got no reason to think there was a substandard finish. Um, it's just some people, the aircraft is slightly more smooth, and, 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 and. In this case, I'm not saying that had it anything to do with it. Just making a sort of an aerodynamic observation here. All right. The point is here that here we are sitting with something that you can't fly past the stall. In a normal conditioned aircraft, the elevator will always be at two degrees less than the main wing. But now, because the elevator is in front, it's two degrees more than the main wing. So in the standard, the aircraft can be pitched way beyond, and if you can impact with a mountain, you could theoretically do this. In this aircraft, you can't, and the impact speed is going to be high. In fact, as high as uh, probably the stalling speed. Now, it was established that the engine failure uh, due to a distributed drive gear. Uh, that was unfortunate, and that left only one option, really, and that is to land to the closest beach. There's no indication that the pilot considered this, or at least not that we can pick up from what he said to the tower and what he intentions and where he was flying and stuff like that. But in his mind, safety was lying at the airfield. Unfortunately, that was the wrong decision. And the question is going to be, but when must we make these decisions? Uh, it can't always be the right decisions. Turning back to the airfield result in a few hundred feet loss. Okay, that we can understand. There was just not enough height to fly back to Port Elizabeth. And the high ampex speed, I believe, is due to the design. Because the last thing on his mind would have been to get a... Uh, let's say a hell of a lot of speed and then uh, pushed it into a very deep stalled flare. Uh, I'm not sure if that would have made a, a, a big difference. And then you see the last one, he, he, he turned slightly. And I think that was just, uh, in fact, on the, on the next slide, it, it was, uh, he, he was turning to the right. Uh, I think it was just to line himself up with the gorge. All right, now what lessons do we take away? Remember, these are the most important ones because um, there was nothing wrong with the person. It was a, a, a decision that was just not correct at the moment in time. 
He didn't have the world of time to decide upon it. It, it is right on you. So the first thing that I want to say is remember that when you are flying over high built up areas, your heights and when you are going to do what, those are decisions that must need, well, that needs to be do, done before the flight. During the flight, it's going to be absolute pandemonium and chaos. Why? Because the adrenaline is going to pump to such a level and then you must get back to normal and then you will make a decision, but now you've got to dig it up, which is the best one. But if there was a decision at this height, I get an engine cut, I go there, then it's fine. At that engine there, if I've got so much height, I can glide back to, to, uh, to the airfield. All right. It's, it's not that bad, but remember, if you're in built-up areas, this is, well, it's critical. Um, there's no other way to say it. Know your aircraft light performance, know the rate of descent, know the amount of height loss during a 980 degree turn. Okay, when operating from a built up area, know that the high speed need before the turnabout, successful, know that the distance from the runway where your possibly landing place may be. Preference should be open beaches, water surfaces long enough, unusable roads and long enough open areas. And in this place, there was no long enough open areas. There was nothing like a road that you could land on that was absolutely out. There was only the beach or the sea. Let's call that the same. Just on that one, just a little chirp. If you go for the seaside, the beach side, and you cannot land on the beach and you have to land in, in the sea, do not land in the breakwater. Land behind the breakwater. Because divers cannot see in the breakwater. Ah, just a little bit of extra information. Uh, aboard, um, the aboard, uh, you know, takeoff must be for the... We sit on the beginning of the runway and recite if we take off here. And I know that we don't do that anymore. We've done a hundred times and I've taken off from this airfield a hundred times. The recitement of what you are going to do at V1, 2, 1, VR, whatever the case must be, and how you do it, is where am I going to go? What am I going to touch, feel, see, do? That must come from, yeah, in the back of the mind, let's say in the, in the deep recesses of the mind, and it must be brought to the, the, the front of the mind so that you can, the decisions, are, they're already made. It's just a question of, implying of applying those decide before takeoff what your plan is going to be. if never happens till it happens and then it would always be a surprise but pre decision making can save your life you know this is a very important sentence here that i'm i'm just saying we have to learn from this i i believe unnecessary death but now it unfortunately happened, and, and we have to learn. That's the respect we can show, is to say, listen, guys, before you take off, <laughs> make the decisions. Once there is trouble, the decision-making, there is simply just not enough time. Time is expressed in height. Time is expressed in speed. But all of those are overpowered by the condition underneath you. You might have the best height and the best speed, but nowhere to land. So, decide. And the decisions must be made on very good, uh, let's call it, uh, use the manual of the procedure. Look at your aircraft. It must be understood and it must be understood well. All right. Always follow the procedures, no matter how much in a hurry or how relaxed you are. Okay, so you cannot not plan. You cannot not know. You cannot take the chance. The energy that you put in now normally is worth a lifetime. All right, that was all for the Cozy Fish Eagle. Um, hang in there and please use the information. That's why I'm giving it. Until next time.